way back. Uh, I don't know how long we've known each other, like nine years, ten years, maybe something like that. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. So, thanks again for joining and and sort of you know sharing your insights in terms of how your experience has shaped up over the course of years. Um, and also, you know, we'll, we'll be diving in uh, more details around uh, what students can do to get to where you are, right? So, a lot of it is kind of uh, more sort of knowing a lot more and probably even talking a little bit about AI in general as well, because that's your core sort of expertise. So, why don't you just kick us off uh, in terms of, you know, just giving a quick deep into your intro about yourself uh, to our students as well. Yeah, sure. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Gaurav. And I work for Google AI, also known as Google Research, at the New York office. I specifically work on natural language understanding. Uh, so <clears throat> natural language processing, as uh, most of you might know. Uh, so uh, yeah, I, I think, I, I guess that's the high level introduction of me. I think before coming here, uh, like joining Google, I did my master's at Carnegie Mellon University in language technologies. And even before that, I was actually at uh, DE Shaw, uh, Hyderabad, uh, where I met Mayank, I think around nine years ago. Uh, I was a software engineer there, and I'm a research engineer in Google, uh, working on AI solutions for natural language understanding. Awesome. So, why don't you just tell, tell us what, what's the exciting part in AI that you're working on? Uh, uh, is it more sort of research oriented, more practical oriented? Where exactly it is? Yeah, so basically, our group uh, and uh, me personally, uh, we, are, we actually conduct research that advances the state of the art in the field. But then, more importantly, we try to apply. Uh, that research or AI to products and to new domains and develop tools to ensure that every can, everyone can access AI. So what we want to do is we want to use AI to augment the abilities of people, to enable them to accomplish more and then allow them to spend more time on their other creative endeavors. So, uh, so like my groups, uh, focus is limited to natural language understanding. So uh, to give you an example, like translation is an example or whether two sentences or paragraphs are similar or not. There are many applications uh, within Google and uh, I'm sure outside Google also where it is useful to know these things. Uh, question answering, given a question, can you answer it uh, given a paragraph? So, uh, or I, I don't want to go in details of natural language processing, but uh, because uh, many of us might not know that in depth, uh, but at a high level, this is what we do. So to answer your question, uh, we do open-ended research. Obviously we want to push the state of the art in the field, but uh, it's important that we apply it to the products inside Google. So have you, like, has any of, uh, you know, your immediate sort of work seen action in some, uh, you know, some Android ecosystem, some, uh, you know, uh, some other product that a lot of people know and love, right? Take. Yeah. So I think um, our research is used in, um, obviously Google search, uh, Google assistant, like uh, many of you must be having Google home at your places, uh, YouTube um, and the Google ads you see. So uh, I cannot share the exact details how, but um, like I can give you a, a small example. So when you Google search these days, you can see an answer for many of the questions, like if you ask why sky is blue or uh, what is the age of a celebrity or things like that, uh, you now, instead of 
just seeing the search links, you can see the exact answer for most of the questions. So um, AI has contributed a lot to improve the quality and coverage of such answers. So like the answers are better now and we can answer more questions uh, using AI. Uh, and then uh, me specifically, I am more focused towards multilinguality and cross-linguality, which means I want to make it work not only for English, but for as many languages as possible around the world. So uh, we call it internationalization. Uh, so uh, that's another focus that these AI solutions are not only limited to English, but languages across the world, uh, which include many Indian languages also. Got it, got it. So, you know, we both actually started our career at Disha, right? So, uh, Again, Disha is one of the one of the elite tier companies that goes only to top tech schools and you know uh, top tech colleges only. Um, very much like Google, Facebook, and and the rest of the gang, right? So, so generally for students that might be in, you know the, all the way from their first year to final year or or even graduates, right? Uh, how how do you recommend that students sort of think about? Uh, preparing if they're preparing for you know companies easily that the competition is so tough right so do you have any general guidelines first let's talk focus on, on you know the india segment and then we'll sort of take the conversation broader to just the globe right right uh, so <clears throat> so i think the ways uh, things are different between india and us let's let's start with india i think in india uh, many of the students are recruited through on-campus on placements. Uh, I'm talking about fresh graduates. So people start with these on-campus placements and uh, these companies have certain, certain um, so like these companies basically conduct uh, standardized tests across the campuses to find out candidates and then interview them. Uh, like, again, I'm talking about companies like Google, Facebook, or Disha. Uh, whereas in US, it's more of, the culture is more of uh, off-campus placement. So, like, obviously there are job fairs where company come and take your resumes, but they don't conduct any kind of standardized tests, like being done at many colleges in India. Uh, so basically you kind of apply as a uh, industry hire. So like even uh, fresh graduates apply as industry hires here. So that's the main difference. Now as uh, like for advice, I think um, uh, I can talk about say Google. Uh, what Google is looking for in fresh cat graduates is basically these problem solving skills. And they try to uh, evaluate them by asking say algorithm questions. Like that's the focus usually. They ask you a lot of algorithm and data structure oriented questions. And maybe there would be also a design question to uh, understand your overall knowledge about software systems or software engineering. So I would say it's important to develop those skills early on or th throughout your uh, undergraduation, like how to work with algorithms, how to work with data structures, but at the same time, know about software systems as well, because uh, many companies do like a part of uh, the hiring process also evaluates how well you know these uh, software systems and how you can work with them. Uh, uh, can you even design them? Do you know uh, how can you design? Like at a high level, they might not do a deep dive into it for fresh graduates. For industry hires, yeah, they will focus more on uh, this design system design aspect of it than algorithms 
so that that changes a bit for industry hires uh, yeah but uh, I, I think uh, that's true for mm-hmm. both India and US right I think uh, so a little like what I've seen normally is like a lot, a lot of students kind of come up with this kind of a, uh, a hypothesis that uh, you know um, they're usually always debating like should I look at you know working at a startup and I'm just starting off fresh right versus when I'm starting off uh, should I aim for you know bigger companies like Google and Facebook and, and, and the likes, right? Uh, and and your sort of uh, uh, preparation focus uh, when you're trying to appear for these companies is very different, right? So, yeah. so when you're ap- approaching Google, Facebook, you need to just you know hone in on data sets and algorithms, but then startups usually are like more well-rounded, etc. But from sort of a career building perspective, what do you? What do you think? Where should students start? Like, do you think there is like a right versus wrong approach, or, or you know, an ideal approach versus a non-ideal approach? Generally, any sense around that? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I feel uh, so. I, I mentioned in India there are these standardized tests. Uh, like, say, for example, Google will conduct a written test and then some other preliminary rounds in order to zero in candidates for interviews because they cannot interview each and every candidate when they go to a campus. And these tests are, I feel, uh, like though I'm using the term standardized tests, they are sometimes ad hoc. Uh, The process is ad hoc basically. So, uh, so, uh, So not everyone can reach up to the interviews um, for many reasons because they might ask questions which are completely irrelevant to what you will end up doing at the company. Like, for example, I don't know, they will ask questions from some random subject uh, from your college. It's possible. Or, uh, yeah, so, and, and it's difficult to prepare for everything. So in that way, I would say, Sometimes it's better to, again, uh, depends on the individual, but I think uh, it's, it's a good, uh, it can be a good strategy to start uh, with a startup and then uh, develop your skills there because th- then you, uh, eventually you will be considered as an industry hire and you need not go through these uh, ad hoc tests which can ask you anything which might be even irrelevant to the role. What, uh, when you have some experience uh, in a startup and you have gained knowledge of software engineering end to end, that's what they would evaluate then um, rather than some random things. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a very good point. Normally, I don't think from that perspective. So uh, people usually consider, right, like, uh, oh, startups more risky. Um, Google has a brand name or Facebook has a brand name, right? Like there's this brand association but nobody really thinks from that perspective, right? Uh, But I think one thing that they usually tack on on that is that like try to see where you're going to get something more focused. Some people are like, hey, I really want to do AI or I really want to do uh, something very specific, right? Like web development or or Android or games or whatever it might be, right? But the moment you enter into these bigger companies, chances of that getting kind of faded away is higher as well, right? Because you get shuffled across different teams and to a certain extent, you lose control over your own sort of, you know, fate, uh, so to speak. So, so now you're a general software developer on an Android team, on an ads team, on a messenger team, you don't know, right? You're just going to be a general software developer. And that's where I think, uh, uh, you know, I usually recommend students that if you have a more dedicated focus that I want to do specifically just this, right? Then a startup that is aiming to do just that might be actually, uh, you know, uh, a more sort of a, uh, tuned in focused sort of uh, approach as well right i agree with you and then uh, adding to that so you raised a good point that when you apply to these big companies as a fresh uh, graduate you are just a general software developer and you might end up in any team means if you're lucky you might end up in a team uh, uh, which matches your interests but uh, it's not necessary. You might end up in like a random team or like that's very much possible and it happens all the time. Whereas if you go to a startup and obviously there you have more liberty about um, working on something which interests you or where your expertise lies and you can 
develop your expertise more and then when we you then when you will try to switch to a company like google or facebook or, or any other big company that time they would consider your expertise and try to match with the team where your expertise can be used uh, so th that time they will not just put you in a random team like a fresh graduate right. so that's definitely there then you get more much more say in the matter right like hey exactly. uh, you know I, i just want to focus on android i just want to focus on react js or something right so so you get more yeah. control over what what you want to do as well right so yes in fact there are these uh, expertise oriented roles at google like if you go to google careers page like you will see terms like um android engineer or machine learning engineer or even natural language processing engineer but fresh uh, graduates are rarely considered for these roles they are usually considered for these general software developer roles mm, right um so that's definitely there there's no denying of that yeah could so uh, just tell us more about you know uh, within your team how how are things structured because there's so much sort of uh, uh hype around ai but there's so lack of clarity in terms of what exactly goes on as an ai developer as an ai researcher when you're working on things right like how's the team structured what kind of projects do you work on do you have like you know um like specific timelines that hey we need to launch this product within next 3 months um you know things like that can you just share some i am you might be sorry able... you, uh, uh, sorry i lost you in between can you repeat your question so, so generally can you share on the like what happens in an ai focused team right uh people think uh that oh ai is just like you say something and out comes a response on the other side right but but how do you get to that stage what all uh you know kind of profiles work together right like you are a researcher is there another senior scientist and a junior developer or a designer or you know what kind of people are needed on a team in order to make something sort of you know work on 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 these lines right yeah so uh uh that's a good question uh, actually uh people with different roles work together in order to reach a solution usually so obviously there are um there is this role like re there are research scientists uh whose job is to usually work on something more exploratory or where they investigate a problem maybe define a problem and uh mm maybe uh try to propose a solution about it uh means engineers can also do it but uh research scientists are uh, have better uh, better skills to do that job then there are obviously engineers and different kind of engineers like there are research engineers who are involved in more applied research like how uh the research or solutions which scientists have come up with how you can uh apply it mm -hmm. to a product or a tool or how can you convert it into a tool there are also like in our case because we work on natural language processing there are linguists mm -hmm. um then there are also so, uh so just so that everybody so, knows uh, can you fill in what exactly is a linguist like it seems like a very fancy term right so uh linguists are uh, people who understand the inner workings of a language uh so i don't know like maybe i should be more formal about what i'm saying yeah, like, I, mean, i mean but generally what what would they end up doing uh, uh like they are sort of subject matter experts on a specific language i would imagine so they like are that. like a, a, they have domain knowledge about languages right right so so let me you know when when i am seeing something in hindi on my android device versus somebody saying in tamil right like it's it's completely different right and and it needs to be interpreted in in that local dialect in the uh, in the regional context uh, and and it might mean something very different right so so i think that's where right uh, and and then they are not, uh, so they basically uh, a good linguist usually can understand a language without even knowing it like mm. for example they can still study a language they don't know and the factors factors that influence language use um 
and they are usually used uh, for say translating analyzing researching and interpreting language okay so i'm guessing this is like heavily on the google translate kind of line of products wherever there is a translation component um yeah definitely then but there are other aspects also um but i will have to uh, go in deeper details which i don't want to do okay. uh, there are other things other than translation also they do got it got it okay, cool so it looks like we have some so they are domain experts and the domain is language in this case got it okay cool uh, so ashutosh is asking what is the objective of the live session so ashutosh generally this is more of an open ended conversation in terms of understanding ai and since all of us here you can ask any specific questions as well um which is the most remarkable job post as an ai employee uh hmm okay i, I don't know if there is a specific answer to that what is the most remarkable job post uh as an ai so i i guess we will just frame it from from your context like you know from your career path now that you are spending so much time in doing research around ai and and not just actually implementing stuff right uh, uh research is not what people normally think about right so where is, where is this called a kind of career path going for you um i i i i guess i don't understand the question really well but uh, so normally okay, like i would, like you know i'll just rephrase so if i am a developer right i i know that okay i'll mature into a senior developer into a lead developer into a project lead or or you know there is a very yeah. clear linear hierarchy right uh, but but for somebody who's an ai engineer probably it's sort of linear as well in the same way but for an ai researcher right like now it's a very different uh, uh, line of work so what do you think is like the uh, you know yeah so i think uh, it's a similar a career path in the sense means yeah you just work on ai solutions so you just uh, keep going more that, deep into research sorry you just keep going more deep and deep into research it's it's uh, means research is a very vague term um, i hmm. would uh, rather call it um, like you're working on ai solutions or machine learning like people work on back end and front end and whatever uh we we are working with a different kind of technology mm. so which uh, also involves uh, exploration and investigation and other roles also do include it like uh, i'm sure someone who works on uh, reducing latency has to uh, basically run several experiments or explore a lot what what would work best that's research in a way Mm-hmm. when you are basically weighing in different options and exploring them individually and are uh, doing an investigative search uh, that's research uh, it's just that somehow this term is associated more uh, these days when you work on ai and machine learning because these are relatively new fields and less mature than um other areas people work in yeah so the career path remains the same you will become a senior engineer you will become a lead and uh then your job might be uh basically to come up with ideas which are worth exploring or investigating mm. and then people under you would work on that so i think a career path kind of uh, remains similar got it okay uh malhar is another question uh, regarding coding platforms like lead code code chef uh he finds them very hard so in order to fill this gap and land a uh job at google um you know any general suggestions um around that again i i'm guessing this is more from a context of a of a fresh grad right so somebody who's just yes. first first job uh so is the question are these websites useful or no uh, so the question is that um, like uh, he's tried these websites he finds them generally harder um like the okay. question difficulty is hard so how do you go about you know bridging the gap um um i think short answer i can give is like practice 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 <laughs> but uh, that's a cheap yeah, yeah i i know i think the, uh, these websites are definitely useful uh like people can also go to actually there is a tech dev guide of google it's publicly available i can share the link is there a way to share a link on uh, yeah so there's a chat option uh, at the bottom so you can directly 
share the links there. Okay, yeah. So this actually, um, yeah, so it's a very nice guide for someone who is just starting to uh, improve their technical skills. Mm. Uh, and it has, um, it has useful pointers about uh, learning foundations of programming. If you want to get into advanced programming, people interested in machine learning, there are pointers for that also, cloud computing. Mm. Uh, so there are resources there which can be useful. Uh, and they kind of try, uh, start from more, uh, it's more basic than say, starting with some uh, programming question website directly. So can be useful. Okay, cool. I think, yeah, one thing I'll add to that is just generally, I think, uh, specifically for that particular question, I think uh, what usually helps is like, you know, um, start with the, normally all of these questions, like questions usually have a tag of difficulty rating, right? So you want to start with the um, easy ones and sort of work your way upwards in difficulty as well uh, to kind of, you know, uh, understand. And then obviously uh, specific topics have different strategies, right? So if you might solve linked list questions in a very different way versus, you know, um, some dynamic programming questions in a very different way, right? So, so there are different strategies that apply to specific types of categories of problems. Uh, one approach is to start with easy and, and start working your way up. And another thing you, I've usually found is that you can find answers to 99% of all these questions before you even, so sit with a question, try to rack your brain into breaking it down into smaller pieces uh, and, and sort of coming up with an answer. Uh, if you're not able to logically come up with an answer, right, like Google for the solution and try to see where the things are kind of missing in your solution versus the actual solution, right? And try to identify why uh, you miss those points. Like, like forget the code, forget the actual implementation, but think logically, right? So once you start getting a hang of logic um, and sort of, you know, the approach to solving these problems, then only go into actually implementing them. Otherwise, you know, implementation, anybody can do once they know the logic, right? Logic is the hard part. So you want to master logic um, and, and just write it on a piece of paper, right? Like don't even try to write on, on um, you know, uh, computers. So usually I think I've personally found that to be very helpful anytime sort of debugging, you know, any super hard problems. Pen and paper always works best. Uh, yeah, I agree with uh, Mayank. Um... Also, uh, means if we have time, I can take five minutes to tell like how I see people should approach problems. When do we have that? Yeah, yeah absolutely, absolutely, good, good. So, uh, so I always uh, tell that, uh, tell to, especially people who are uh, in college right now, when I talk to them, I usually tell this to them, that whenever we approach a problem, uh, means I'm kind of uh, paraphrasing what my already said, but uh, maybe this can be useful. So when we see a problem, say like, I'm taking a very simple thing, uh, say whether a string is a palindrome or not, it's a simple problem. But I think the, there are four, four steps we, sh, uh, we should follow in order to solve this problem. One is can, we should try to solve this problem without using our computer science skills. Like anyone even without, with zero computer science background can tell whether a string is a palindrome or not. So I think before just jumping in directly, thinking about the data structure or algorithm or code, uh, I feel it's always very useful to try to solve it on a paper or just as a person with zero com computer science uh, background. Like anyone can tell whether a string is palindrome or not. And the way they are doing it is they are just comparing the first and the last, like, yeah, they are basically do, doing a forward and backward pass and comparing character. Yeah. So like even someone with the, which, who, who doesn't know anything about computer science can do it. Then the next step is, can we uh, map that thinking to an algorithm? Now that's where your computer science skills come into the picture. Can we map that into an algorithm? And uh, so, uh, which can involve like dynamic programming or I don't know, there are other kind of things, uh, graph theory or things like that. The next step is to map this algorithm into code. That's where data structures come into the picture because you would have to think, okay, this is the algorithm in my mind, but what exactly I will have to use? Should I use an array or a linked list or tree or something else? 
and then the fourth step is like once you start writing the code i think it's important you do proactive test testing and uh, keep coming up with test cases uh, while writing the code uh, so i think these are the four important steps and uh, depending on the question uh, you might spend different amount of time on different steps like there are questions where you will spend a lot of time in the first step itself like uh, to be able to solve it yourself even can take a lot of time but then uh, the code might be very short and that might not take a lot of time in some cases uh, coming up with an algorithm or a solution is uh, easy uh, or it's very short but writing code is longer and deciding what data structures to use and implementing them might be tough so I, I think these are the four steps. Uh, usually, uh, uh, students should follow, and these are the exact four skills many of the companies even evaluate you on. Like, what what's your general co cognitive ability? That's that comes from the first step, and then algorithm, and then coding and data structures. The third step, whether you test your code proactively or not, or how good you are at at coming up with test cases so these are the exact things uh, most of the companies i believe evaluate you on yeah no, i think that's actually pretty spot on right so one thing usually what i've seen is like in that step one when people are practicing especially developers are really bad at communication right like it's a very well known fact that devs are are horrible when it comes to communication so what i've seen is and and this can work as a strategy is right like you look at a problem on lead code code chef whichever website doesn't matter right um, you're you're sitting down with a pen and paper kind of thinking about okay i need to move this box here move that box here how do how should i figure out a solution like i am talking keep talking right like keep verbalizing whatever is going on in your head because what that does is if, if Gaurav was taking my interview right now and I was trying to do it online, like, like with coronavirus, every fucking thing is shut down, right? Uh, people are resolving to online virtual interviews and whatnot, right? Even if you're in the same city, uh, you need to be able to communicate things clearly, right? Like, and not, not just write code clean, but actually be able to tell your code, right? Like tell your solution, right? Let's as good as if you can come up with a solution, but you can't tell it to another person, it's as good as not having a solution, right? Uh, so, so you want to verbalize your answers while you're trying to come up with them, right? Um, and, and the other person can, you know, actually guide you in the right way as well because interviewers are not there to screw you over, right? They want to help you crack the interview so they can go back to their job and close the interview process, right? So, so you want to keep talking on, on top of what you're doing, right? Okay, so what if I move this here? What if I move this here? No, 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 that doesn't work. Okay, it will break here, right? Like, so, so you're talking through your mental process and it will give an interviewer insight into how you think about problems and how you think about problem solving. And that can be a big boost uh, of confidence to anyone uh, who's trying to potentially recruit you, right? So, so I personally feel that can be a big deal maker for any. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Uh, uh, thanks for bringing this up because this is something, uh, uh, so there are these four steps, but throughout these four steps, you have to communicate. It's not only in the first part, I, I feel you have to communicate throughout. So that's, that's something you have to do simultaneous to these four steps. Like keep communicating like, uh, like and that's something obviously, uh, that's a big chunk of what you're evaluated on, mm -hmm. your communication and comprehension skills. Yep. And I, I feel the best way to crack this part is to be able to talk to the inter interviewer as if that person is your peer and not someone who is actually evaluating or, or like, I don't know, a teacher or something, but um, more of like, you should be able to talk to the interviewer as a peer. Like, just imagine if you're working on a project, how, how will you talk to a peer about a problem? Uh, that's exactly what we have to do uh, when we interview. And if you do that, uh, it results in awesome results usually. Uh, so a slight bit of a nuance there is like like a lot of times in India when you're interviewing with a lot of smaller companies, right? Uh, they expect to be called sir, right? Like the sir culture okay. is very big in India, right? Like people think that, okay, sir is important. And, and if you're not calling me sir, you're not showing me respect, right? I know on an international level that that means absolutely 
nonsense right in our company we have a no sir culture right like uh, but like by sheer nature in being in education a lot of people come up and ah, say sir just because it's in the educational context right i keep telling them my name is mayan my name is not sir call you mayan but it's kind of like you know uh, i think that's a very good point because now uh, what that does is that majority of people don't realize that the moment you call another person by their name right uh, you're leveling the playing field right you're not saying that hey this interviewer is higher in authority than me right like you're trying to uh, prove yourself to the company and the company is trying to prove uh, themselves to you right and that balance of power needs to be equal and that's what majority of people think uh, they they forget about it they think oh i i just need a job so naturally they i need to respect this them they can disrespect me or something the equation is not that skewed right it needs to be equal in order to make any relationship work so cool so ashutosh is saying um, for google you can approach gsoc yeah gsoc is a pretty good option as well uh, and it's currently inviting applications uh, thanks ashutosh for sharing that information so guys if you're interested gsoc is apps uh, taking in applications uh, what are the skills needed in google for a fresher i think we've covered that question more or less uh, again and again um, any information regarding gorov's profile um, we did cover that in the beginning as well uh, shikhar is asking i'm also from a non computer science background um, coding is so bad so is it possible to cover up and learn all the data structures algorithms uh, and complete ai i think uh, so what do you think is it possible it is possible i, I have seen not many people doing that uh, it means yeah short answer is it is possible and i have i have been personally in touch with people and have guided people who have successfully uh covered these topics and learned these things and then they got hired by uh big companies so so this kind of I, i'm going to plug in my question here in between uh uh what like what are the core things that people sort of Um, have a misconception when it specifically coming to ai right uh, it's not the same as you know web dev development or android development or or something where you learn a specific tool set and now you're good to go right uh, typically that's what developers think if any time they want to start a new uh, framework or a new you know vertical or something right uh, but like do you see some common very common misconception from people who are uh software engineers looking to transition into an ai specific role right uh kind of making some obvious mistakes and obvious sort of uh assumptions and then they realize oh fuck i need to learn this shit as well right yeah uh so ai is very broad right there is like theoretical ai and then there is applied ai and i have seen many people feel that you must be an expert in advanced mathematics to be able to do ai and machine learning and deep learning that's actually not true mm. means there are certain people who who, who uh, and their focus is very theoretical in these fields they would need those skills uh, sure but that means i feel even, even people with a zero computer science background and who don't have like strong ma- mathematics background can do really well in ai so that's one big misconception when many people say, when you say they can do well in ai you mean the applied side of ai right like that i'm just yes. that that's right that. that's what i meant because uh, again ai is broad and there are so many things to do in ai like there are, so ai is so i would say a, uh, it's a broad term but it, it's a tool basically now people who try to make that tool better they have to be more theoretical like they will have to come up with a uh, new optimization algorithms or like mm-hmm. they have to come up with a better framework for ai uh, then yeah you might need strong mathematics background but if you want to take ai as a tool and apply it to different problems and domains that doesn't require any of this mm-hmm. and a lot of work uh is around this actually to be able to use ai as a tool and apply it to different problems and domains hmm got it so but generally you know uh, just quickly sort of differentiate between applied and sort of 
non-applied so that you know everybody's on the same page and, and they understand kind of what the core differences are oh oh you want to want me to clarify that again yeah. uh so like okay let me uh, give you an example like uh for example uh, say for example you want to do um, some kind of classification like you have many documents mm -hmm. and you want to and then you have say three topics you want to classify all these documents into these three or four topics right this is the problem we are facing we have to do this now i don't so applied is and now there are these existing algorithms to do that mm -hmm. uh classification algorithms which you can uh, understand also easily now basically pre-processing data and you know uh, uh defining the problem and then uh, designing the whole pipeline and then using this algorithm in that pipeline this is applied because you're not changing the algorithm as such there is already an algorithm to uh, classify things mm -hmm. given the data so like so basically what you're doing is you're maybe pre-processing the data so that it can be used by the algorithm and then how will you use the output of that algorithm uh, and uh, solve your problem this process is applied but if you want to change the algorithm itself or you want to make it better uh, uh, or faster or other things like you want to change the inner workings of the algorithm this classification algorithm that would not be called applied that will become theoretical got it so so i think uh... Okay. Like, I'm, like I'm, I'm usually a very lazy programmer. I learn only the things that I need to learn in order to get the job done, right? So if, if I want to get into applied AI, uh, do I really need to know some math or do I need to go back and revise my math from college days and, and school days or can I get away with math and just, you know, start building AI projects? Uh, you need not go back to your maths class again. So sure. I can still start working on, you know, AI projects. Yes. Right means you would not be able to uh, uh, do this research. So when I say research in the sense, you would not be able to come up with new algorithms. Right, I mean, uh, the same way you said, right? Like if I want to just tag documents with certain uh, things, I just need to apply an existing algorithm and then and I probably need to learn some uh, libraries in Python and whatnot, right? So- Right, and then there are several methods uh, uh, which you have to, basically, in order to run how to train a machine learning model given an algorithm you don't need much math maybe mm -hmm. elementary maths got it yeah yeah good so a uh, couple of other questions what is more important for ai uh, competitive programming or projects to get into companies um, i'm not sure specifically google or or generally companies uh, can you answer that okay uh so i think we have kind of covered programming like they look for general problem solving skills and i think we have kind of covered that uh for ai actually or specifically for ai yes oh for ai yeah so for fresh grads if you want to get into ai you need to have some experience in ai beforehand mm. so it's difficult to be able to get into an AI role without much experience in it uh, or, or just by taking classes on AI you would not get such a role like in your school hmm. you have to do I think usually uh, companies and recruiters look for first-hand experience with working on an AI project if you're looking for those kind of rules and that there are two ways to it like sometimes people do internships and work on such projects or i think as we discussed before you join a startup where you can work on ai problems and then try to if it's a question about getting into a company like google yeah, yeah. um now for startups 
Uh, I'm not an expert on that. I have never worked in a startup. So, yeah. but I, I believe there can be startups where you can start work because in a startup, uh, you have more liberty on choosing an area and a problem than a big company. So it's possible there to be able to work on these AI problems, even without much prior experience in that field. Right. I think, yeah. So on the startup side, I can definitely answer that particular question. I think projects value is way more. Uh, startups will definitely check for basics of your data structures and algorithm and problem solving and all the four steps that Gaurav talked about before as well, right? So that is definitely going to be there. They're not going to go 100% deep into comparative programming uh, and they're going to look at projects. So you're better off uh, doing data structures, algorithms to a uh, intermediate level, right? Uh, where where you know even, you know, graphs and, and uh, trees, but you don't need to know all the uh, fancy jazz for backtracking and, and whatnot, right? So uh, generally you want to have a bell for a startup, you need to be more sort of a well-rounded personality, right? Like, you know, good amount of almost everything, right? So if you're aiming for a very specific AI role, you definitely need to know Python. You definitely need to know Keras or any other library, Pandas and all that stuff and have projects on your resume, right? Like, uh, always have projects on your resume. It always adds value, right? Uh, for startups, very heavily. For bigger companies, okay-ish, right? Uh, bigger companies usually say that if you don't have projects, fine, but at least you should have top-notch data structures, logical problem solving, uh, you know, cognitive ability, those kind of things is, is much higher rated because they can train you on a lot of these internal technologies. They will and naturally train you even if you come in prepared as well. So so that's where kind of the difference is. Uh, but I think like Gaurav said, right, like you're probably better off cracking into a, a startup just because uh, your odds will be much higher at, at an early age, right? Uh, question, is being an intern at a startup beneficial? Um, yes. <laughs> like, I mean... I guess, yes. Yeah, intern at any company is beneficial, right? If the other thing is that you're not an intern anywhere, right? So it's not just beneficial for getting a job, it's just beneficial for you as well, right? Like, uh, I think... Uh, that's where people a lot of keep saying like, what is better for my resume, right? Like they don't ask this question, what is better for me? And ultimately I'm building my career, right? I'm not building my resume, I'm building my career. So, so being an intern anywhere is actually better than if the other option is not being an intern, right? Uh, I don't know whether that question, like, do you have anything else to add? Uh, I, I guess I would have said the same thing. Cool. Uh, being an intern anywhere is useful and, um, uh, in a startup, yeah, means um, I don't want to compare. I, I think it's very beneficial to do it at a startup. Um, it's not, uh, even compared to a big company, it's beneficial. Like in a big company, the only advantage is getting converted into that same company is easier. That's the only advantage over being an intern at a startup but uh, you might learn more at a startup i feel being an intern because you will have more liberty compared to a big company because i know that interns at google there are a lot of things they they we can't let them do at google mm, right right no i think yeah uh, like you said right like you have a lot more flexibility at startup right so uh, one thing i think uh, that people often overlook is that at startups you get to expose yourself with not just your role but a lot more things so if you intern at microsoft and google as a developer you might be just you know working purely with a, a decent sized team who are just developers all around right yes you will get to interact with designers etc but in a startup you're, you might be the only developer on your project so so you get a lot more responsibility you get a lot more uh, ownership of things and, and if you fuck up there are there are serious consequences of fucking up as well right so so naturally there's a lot more pressure but there's a lot more intense learning as well because learning also happens a lot on on intense pressure right so, so you, your career path just skyrockets and, and you get to see so many things that you're otherwise not exposed to i think for that i highly recommend people to do a lot of internships at startups uh, during your semester during your 
summer break etc right like startups are willing to give you remote internships even on part time basis right so so you should always try to find more and more internships and that's just going to help you build uh, sort of a well rounded approach to understanding what's what the heck is happening in the industry as well right uh so next question is how can google kickstart help especially towards building an international career uh what does it mean google kickstart so google kickstart is a very specific program so nikunj is the next question is actually on the same lines as well uh google they nikunj participated in the kickstart program round a got rank so and so and rank so and so in hash code and uh is it helpful during the interviews for google so as an intern so oh, uh okay it's the coding competition yeah yeah so yeah anything else on that gaurav i don't know a lot about that competition but i'm sure i don't see a reason why it will not be useful it should be useful yeah now i think that that's generally for all the kind of like you know hackathons and codeathons and what not right you keep having um but do not associate a specific value to any of these right like it's not going to be suddenly you are uh, you have xyz rank in a in some specific thing so naturally that entitles you to a cracking an interview in a particular day right so so just make sure that these are all like sort of small steps that you are taking towards building a better version of you right uh, if you think of that way then you'll associate similar value to google kickstart as well as you know um, a random uh, you know corner shop hackathon as well because you are learning right and everything is going to build your profile right so i think uh, people associate un, uh, like unequal value to you know an event happening down the street versus an event happening at google but it's just a, a matter of like you know you can derive equal value from them and and ultimately all that you learn is going to reflect in your interviews at the end of the day right so so i think that's that's what probably is more important at least that's how i look at it now uh because i've organized a lot of coding contests as well in the past right uh we used to do events in disho as well right so uh it, i think ha- hackathons and and overnight weekend jams was not a thing back then uh now it's become a lot more mainstream so uh that's kind of changed uh can i get instagram handles uh, okay uh at what age gaurav did you start working with google i think 2016 is when you started working right yes i started working in 2016 right uh is there any specific coding languages for ai which language do you prefer actually which language do you work in as well r or python or something else so okay um like for ai yeah. uh, for <laughs> machine learning we use python because at google we use tensorflow hmm. um as a machine learning framework which is in python so a lot a lot of python is used but in order to process data we use c++ so i'm using both c++ and python hmm. yeah i think uh, any specific reason for c++ because um uh the reason for using c++ is we want to do a lot of parallelization because we usually work on a huge amount of data and the frameworks which we use in order to do uh, in order to do this pre processing is in c++ i guess it's faster because yeah you can do a lot more sort of low level optimizations uh that that you just don't have access to in in higher programming languages like python as well yeah. right? so so, so, so i right. think people know map reduce uh hmm. right that was also in means that was there in java also but c++ yeah also so, so yeah. some variant of that also is being used at google so actually like you know um this happened this week only that one of the students asked me that you know hey you have a program for web developers for 6 months you are training them why are you teaching c++ right like like where is the connection so so normally you know my general answer is that c++ is such a important language uh that you'll be uh, you know you'll be surprised that how many top notch companies are still to date using c++ in the very core systems that need the best possible performance right uh, i agree some of cora coras i think the core services and and the core components of their you know uh, logic 
are still written in C++ just because there's so much performance wise, there's so much better compared to any other language, right? And it gives you so much control over how to architect your code in, in you know, the best possible way for performance. So people still think like, oh, we have so many fancy languages that let's just use them, like F of C++. But I think uh, it's still very important to be in touch with that particular industry. Um, yeah, also it's always useful to know at least one object-oriented language. So yeah absolutely yeah yeah cool so guys we'll just quickly wrap up I, i'm just going to take last couple of questions uh, so ananya is asking how should one start with ai in general uh, i think that's a slightly broader question but do you want to concise it down yeah so i think i already shared a pointer and it has uh, pointers for machine learning i think they are uh, good pointers to start Another thing, like personally, so that's what Google suggests to anyone who goes to Google's uh, career page. Uh, and, and I personally feel they are good pointers, but I think uh, there is this Andrew NG's course on Coursera. I think, uh, I think everyone should start from that particular course because that's really basic and uh, doesn't, need you to go back to your math class yeah yeah so i think yeah that's a very good point so i have done that as well three years back uh, but yeah uh, so ananya definitely check out or rather anybody who's interested uh, uh andrew ng just google andrew ng that's the first thing that's probably gonna come up uh, uh his course in coursera uh is pretty awesome so there are separate courses uh uh for uh, uh reinforcement learning there's a separate course by the guy from uh, uh, i forgot the guy who worked on the 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 chinese game uh, the evolved version of chess go uh, what's the name of the company deep uh, london company uh, deep mind deep mind yeah yeah so so he's part of that team right so he's made a very good course on on uh, reinforcement learning which is separate from uh you know uh, what people normally associate machine learning with right so supervised and unsupervised and reinforcement so re reinforcement is that um one last question did you work on any ai projects in any game uh <laughs> i'm working on one oh you're working on a game project in but i can't share the details which game what exactly i'm doing uh but yeah um uh, I'm, I'm excited to work on uh so, so yeah, I'm trying to work on something new and this is not, this cannot be applied directly to a product inside Google, but yeah, this is more academic. Okay. And you're using games to kind of uh, test the algorithms or, or something, something like something. Usually that's the more common use. Yeah, but these language. are not, um, I'm not working on the kind of game you might be thinking. I'm thinking of actual people playing a game like uh, Dungeons and Dragons, those kind of games. Oh, okay, got it, got it, okay. Because yeah. I work on natural language, right? And mm -hmm. I, so basically for me, the signal there is what people are talking. Oh, okay, got it. So you're like taking the language component for AI and then combining <laughs> it with the actual games, uh, like a card-based, dice-based kind of games. Yeah. Well. Cool, awesome, sounds good. I'm, I'm, like this is not coming out publicly though right uh um, like is the plan down the road like when once it, you said it's not connected to any product means, people say. are working on this so this is nothing uh, uh like Public. there are other people also working on it in general like publicly there are articles and also oh, okay okay cool cool awesome so i think uh uh, quite insightful chat overall um, uh, there's a link that Gaurav shared guys so you guys can just go and check that uh, uh, if you are looking for specific resources that Google themselves recommend right uh, for getting started so so that might help you guys uh, in some way or the other and if you have any other follow-up questions uh, just put them down in, in you know uh, discord I'll probably try and pass them along uh, to Gaurav as well cool Gaurav so thanks for taking out the time I know um, it's working day for you uh, as well so i'll let you get a move on any sort of closing thoughts um uh, i yeah i mean i i guess um 
it was a nice exchange. I, I, I actually loved answering questions from Mayank and other uh, people in the chat. So it was great and I'm open to more questions and good. even answer them offline if sounds good. Sounds good. something has been missed. If something comes along, I'll definitely pass it on to you and share the responses. Cool. So thanks, Varav. Uh, again, uh, really appreciate it. We'll probably invite you again sometime in the future as well. Right? Sure. Right. See you. I, I would be happy to help. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye.